Chapter 26 I was sitting on the porch with Jerry Lynn, slash Amanda, who was still in an altered state, staring at the truck on the street in front of the house. It was like neither of them were really there in that moment. I had tried conversation, but she could not hear me, or she had no interest in responding. What is that? asked Michael when he saw her sitting expressionless on the front step. That is Jerry Lynn, the sister of the girl who is inside right now, who I need you to protect, I answered. No, that is not a person right now, said Michael. That is a body, a body that is living, but it is not occupied. Oh, that explains some things. I said, earlier she was Amanda and then she was Jerry Lynn. Mediums said Michael. That always makes things confusing. Granny Bean came around the house and caught sight of Mike. She finished with the last layer of sprinkled salt and then hobbled her way over to us. I see you done brought some help there, Crow, she said. He sure is a big un. Mike smiled at her, his white teeth flashing. Hello, Granny. It's nice to see you again. I looked back and forth between the two of them, a bit confused. You two know each other? Long story, said Mike. That wall is impressive. Seems like it has a bit of demon blood in there. Very nice. That's because of that crow boy, said Granny. He done killed a demon boy that was after my girl Jenna. That's why we was helping him with his friend. I see, said Mike, grinning at me. I didn't know you were so tough, Ray. I'm not. He's still alive. I did break his neck and left him in a pile of trash behind a truck stop. (laughs) Nicely done. Anyone I know, he said. Mr. Lewis. Oh, that's right. Gabe told me, said Mike. Now what can I do for you, Granny? My grandbaby's in there about to give birth. I want both of them safe. I think you know what she needs protecting from, she said. Jazeel programmed his preacher boy to come and bless the baby, I said. That baby is one of the special ones like Amanda was. If he gets his hands on her, that would be complete disobedience to all the rules, said Mike. The baby's too young. No permission given. Do you think that Jazeel gives a flying fuck about your rules anymore? I asked. His pride has become too large for that. He only wants influence and control over humanity because he sees them as weak and disgusting. A normal habit for many of your angelic hosts. This baby is important for humanity. Not for the fight of good against evil, nor for the fight of darkness and light for humanity and her right to make her own choices, to have her own free will must be protected. Right or wrong, she has to have the ability to choose. Mike set his jaw for a moment. You're right, Crow. This is the way that was set when the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was planted. I do not like the evil side of that knowledge. But as much as it pains me, that freedom of choice must be protected. You boys may be all high and mighty with your fancy words, but that there is my great-grandbaby about to be born. And I don't give a damn about no heaven or hell when it comes to my children. Them's my children. And it be my duty to protect them, be it a person, an angel, or a devil. They still mine, and I ain't too proud to accept help from a crow or a colored man on a Harley. Michael, you stay here with Jenna and you protect my kin. Crow, you're coming with me and Jerry Lynn and the preacher. We still have work to do, said Granny. I will do everything in my power to protect your kin, Granny, said Mike. I know you will said Granny, and motioned for me to follow her. We got work to do, Crow. Get Jerry Lynn and get in the car, she tossed me the keys. You're driving. I need a nap. My old eyes are too tired for this shit anymore. 
I took Jerry Lynn by the hand and led her to the car. She got silently into the passenger seat and fastened the seat belt without saying a word. Jeremiah was propped up against one window in the back. Granny took the seat next to him. I got in the front and started the car. Inside it smelled like cigarette smoke and fast food. Where are we going? I asked. Stull, came the answer from Amanda slash Jerry Lynn's mouth. She was still staring directly ahead of her. The cemetery. Do you have the box? I done got it right here next to me, said Granny. Jerry Lynn, you doing okay, honey? Yeah, Granny, came Jerry Lynn's voice. I'm still in here. We both just trying to hold on till the right time comes. I understand, child, said Granny. Hurry, Crow. This is hard on a body and mind to hold two at once. I don't like doing this for any longer than necessary. It ain't natural. You know where Stull is? I nodded. It was the place Amanda was buried. Back in the 1970s, an urban legend had sprung up around the cemetery that it was one of the seven gates of hell, which is ridiculous. As if there are only seven or even permanent ones. However, human belief does some strange things. If the belief is there for long enough, not only does it wear a path in the human mind, it also wears down places and makes a scar. And this was a place with a scar. A place where the barriers between the worlds had been weakened. Not by tragedy, but by belief. The story is that the Pope would not fly over Stull because of its great evil. Which is horse shit. But that's still where we were headed. Amanda had grown up in Stull. Her family still lived there. I looked at Jerry Lynn, and her face was still impassive. There were circles under her eyes as she stared ahead into empty space. When we pulled on to 435 westbound... The lowering sun made it difficult to see, shining directly in my face. I pulled down the visor to block it. Then I pulled down hers as well. She didn't even seem to notice the glare, blinking, only occasionally. In the back seat, Jeremiah was still unconscious. Granny was snoring loudly. By the time we got to Lawrence, the sun was a red ball on the horizon. And by the time we reached Stull Cemetery, there was only a red glow. The cemetery was bordered by a chain-link fence, and the gate was closed. I parked at the gate and got out of the truck, leaving it running. I tried the gate, but it was locked. I could hear Granny's door opening, and I went over to help her out as a Kansas Highway Patrol car pulled up. The officer got out of the car and shone a flashlight on us. "'Can I help you folks?' he asked." Granny got out of the truck and hobbled towards the officer with her cane, smiling and waving, looking as innocent and sweet a grandma as ever had existed. Hello, young man, she said sweetly. Could you help my grandson open the gate and let us in? We've been traveling all day and just got here. My great-granddaughter is buried inside. We came to pay our respects. I was in the hospital when she passed, and I couldn't attend the funeral. I could see tears running down her wrinkled cheeks. Could you come back tomorrow? asked the officer. The gates close at sundown to prevent vandals. I understand, but we traveled so long today, and I wanted to leave some of my cookies on her grave. She loved my cookies. Tears continued to roll down her face as she held up the cookie tin. Ma'am, I cannot let you in there, said the officer. Granny crumpled in on herself, almost collapsing into the officer, sobs racking her body. Please, please, let me see my grandbaby's grave. He looked up and his eyes met mine. I could see he was torn. Could you please make one exception for her, officer? I asked. All right, he said, but be careful, and when I come back around on patrol, I want you out of here. He helped Granny back into her seat before he unlocked the gate. Granny rolled down her window to speak with the officer as we drove through the entry. God bless you, child. God bless you, she said as she patted his hand. Once we were through the gate, she was the cantankerous old woman who got into the car back in Kansas City. 
You know where she's buried, Crow? I remembered it well. I had sat in the trees around her funeral and watched them lower the casket, holding her body into the earth. It was an image I would carry with me for the next thousand years, perhaps longer. I nodded and drove her to the family plot. We had to walk a bit to get there. Granny and Jerry Lynn followed me, Jeremiah's limp body slung over my shoulder. She was buried at the beginning of January, and it had not yet been warm enough for grass to grow and cover the grave. I put him down in front of her headstone and looked around. I could see the shape of the old church that stood in the cemetery, outlined in the last of the sunlight. This was not a place I would choose to be at night. Places where the barriers are weakened are not comfortable to me. I am tied to this plane. I am made from this earth. And when the other layers peek through, it is not a place that is fully my own. I could hear the wind begin to pick up in the trees. Granny was crouched down in front of Jeremiah now, snapping her fingers and slapping him awake. Get up, stupid preacher man. Time to pay for your sins, she said. Jerry Lynn was standing on the grave, each hand full of the loose earth that she was standing on. I could see her soul light swirling, mixing, receding, being replaced by the hot electric blue of Amanda. She opened her eyes and looked at Jeremiah, who was now awake. Stand up, she said. Face what you did. He stood, staring at her in the darkness the only light coming from the headlights of the truck 100 feet away. You, you, Pastor Jeremiah Anderson. The derision in her voice was palpable. You presided over my funeral. You hugged my parents. You told them that you could not understand why I had decided to take my own life. You told them this. This lie. Well, now you will face what you have done and you will know the depths of your sin. I didn't kill anyone, he said, tears streaming down his face. Amanda killed herself. She chose this for herself. More than anything, I wanted to serve God. I wanted to do good. I wanted to be good. I wanted to help others. But that was taken from me and replaced, Jeremiah. Replaced with the darkness. Darkness that belonged to you. You told me that I was full of evil, that I was evil. I realized that the evil was so big and so terrible that I could never be good. I could never attain good. I could never be good enough. And if I could not be these things, I did not want to live. I did only as the angel told me. He said, only as the angel told me. Did the angel tell you to cut me off from the only thing I thought was good? The only thing you taught me could save me from the darkness? The only place you told me I could be redeemed and forgiven? I see now I had no need of your ministry, of your household, of your church. That it was all a lie that you told, but then I thought it was the truth, and when I thought I could no longer be redeemed, I was no longer worth the air that I breathed. It was the angel, the angel, he said, please forgive me, please forgive me, Amanda. I know this angel, I've seen him too. He's no messenger of God, he's only a messenger of pride and hate. I will have him as well, Jeremiah, but now is your time. I can forgive you. I will forgive you, but there are consequences. Even if you are only a vessel, you still have a choice and you did not choose rightly. Jerry Lynn let the earth drop from her hands. She stooped down and picked up the cookie tin, which had been laying at her feet. This belongs to you. Jeremiah Anderson, not to me. I give it back to you now. She put it in his trembling hands. What is it? He said, staring at the box. The darkness you put in me. 
said Amanda. I don't need it any more. He dropped the box and went to his knees in prayer. Oh, God, forgive me. Send your angel to protect me from this snare of the devil. Jezeel, bring your portion to me. Protect me in my time of need. Fill me with the light of your presence. Bring vengeance upon those who speak against thee. I heard the wind again in the trees and the sound of feathers moving through the air. A warm breeze flew in from the west. There was no trace of the sun on the horizon now. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Granny had been sitting on a gravestone adjacent to Amanda's plot, watching the spectacle in front of her. She felt the change in the air, too. She stood up and sniffed the air. I believe I'll excuse myself, children. Bones are tired. I'm heading back to the truck. Looks like a storm's coming, Crow. You might want to do something about that, she said over her shoulder as she picked her way through the gravestones to the truck. I looked back towards Jeremiah, who was now standing taller than usual. His whole body seemed to be glowing whiter than before. Jerry Lynn stood facing him, a small girl in front of a grown man. I could see her changing in front of me. Her appearance now was completely that of Amanda. Between them was the cookie tin, unopened, dirt spattered. You think to speak against the messenger of God, child, said Jeremiah. But it wasn't Jeremiah. I knew who was speaking. I really didn't think he would come here. Now, I had been sure he would have been after the baby, the new living soul, the one that would further his plans. Not here. Probably should have called Mike to come in with us. Yeah, bad call. I didn't realize that he had so much pride that he would deign to take on a dead girl who was challenging him. But he did, and I had no archangel to back me up. It was me, a hillbilly teenager, and the ghost of an old friend against an angel who had been formed before eternity started. Not that I couldn't take him in a fight. But I would not hurt Jerry Lynn or Granny Bean for the world. Shit. You are no messenger of God, Jazeel. You're only a messenger of your own ego, I said. Oh, I see the judge is here. How convenient, said Jazeel. You can judge in this argument who is right and who is wrong, but I think your ability to remain impartial is in question. Shut up, Jazeel. You will hear testimony of your accuser, I said, and nodded to Amanda to continue. Around us, the air was changing, vibrating. A thin gray fog was coming over the graveyard now, and among the fog were small, flickering green lights. The veil was thinning. You lied to me, angel. You came to me as an angel of light. You said you would help me. You said you would make me someone who could help humanity. All I had to do was let you control me. I only had to destroy everything that I was first. And I did that. She pointed at the ground beneath her. I did that, angel. And now what am I? A shade? caught between light and dark and unable to help anyone, let alone humanity. Your visions were false. You had no care for me or for anything other than your own glory. And whose hand took your life, child? Did I force the pills down your throat or was that your own hand? You had your choices and you made them. He said, now take responsibility for your own actions. I force nothing upon you that you did not invite. Amanda refused to back down. I may have been the one who ended my life, but I ended it in the cause I thought was good, which was your cause, your false cause, your lie. 
Amanda child. You can find forgiveness with God. All you have to do is accept it and go to the light. You are not trapped here. You still have a choice. Don't be selfish as you have in the past. Think of all the pain that you have caused by your actions. The pain you caused your family. The pain you caused your friend Ray, said the angel. Certainly you can do the right thing now and move past the hurt you caused yourself. I will not move on until this has been corrected and you have paid the price, Jazeel, she said. I stand my ground and I accuse you. Then Judge Raven must decide, said Jazeel. Judge Raven, have I infringed on the free will of this human. The air was getting thicker and I could feel the wrath again rising from within me. No, I said, speaking with the authority of those of my rank. No, I have judged you innocent of this crime. Jeremiah's face broke into a grin of triumphant joy. He raised his hands to heaven and laughed. Amanda slash Jerry Lynn stared at me without emotion. But I do judge you guilty of another crime, a sin another of your kind committed a long time ago, Jazeel. I said, the wind began to swirl around us as I gathered the wrath around me, drawing in the energy from the rift in the universe that lay on this land. Pride. Let go of the human vessel which you now control. You will be dealt with by your own kind. If it were up to me, you would be pulled into the rift and cast into outer darkness. But your punishment is to be meted out by Michael, the protector of humankind and the warrior prince of God Almighty. The wrath was now at full strength. I tried to hold it back as Amanda slash Jerry Lynn was too close to its target. Jazeel dropped Jeremiah's body to the ground as if it was nothing more than a discarded doll. He rose into the sky on his pristine white wings, enormous now. Jerry Lynn also fell forward, grabbing the cookie tin on the ground. At that moment, I saw Amanda's soul separate from her. She looked at me with sad eyes, and then she was gone. I struggled to focus on Jazeel to keep him from his escape into the other realms that lay so close to the surface at Stull. The wrath was becoming harder and harder to control. Tree limbs snapped, rain fell from the sky, and then Jerry Lynn opened the cookie tin. Jeremiah was screaming as the tulpa it contained was released and climbed onto him, forcing his mouth wide and then stepped inside like it was pulling on a suit of clothing. The entire sclera of Jeremiah's eyes turned momentarily black. He stopped struggling and then laid there on the grave, sobbing. The cookie tin lay open on the ground, empty except for a handful of dirt from the grave and a couple of sassafras leaves. Jerry Lynn, get in the fucking truck, I yelled. She ran, and the wrath poured out of me, unrelenting, destructive, destructive. disintegrating, the disintegrating of our the reality. part of our reality was cut off, our leaving only that emptiness sat so dark between, between me and Jazeel. Jazeel. I could not control it. I did not want to. The ground melted and shifted. Jazeel's light was cut off, leaving only emptiness so dark I cannot describe it. The scream of an entity that has lived for eternity is something to hear, and the silence after the scream is almost painful. I brought the cookie tin back to the car. I told Granny she couldn't have it, that I would keep it with me for now. I could get her another sewing kit if she wanted it. Not like that one, she huffed. You think 
because you can make things go all crazy like that, you better than me? I don't think so. I listened to her complaining all the way back to Kansas City. We left Jeremiah, or whatever he was now, back in the cemetery for that kind officer to find later. I was pretty sure the preacher was physically weak enough not to cause the cop any problems. Jeremiah would probably be in a mental institution for the rest of his life. He would have the tulpa to keep him company. Jerry Lynn went back to her sullen teenage silence, her phone and her red and orange soul flame. When we got back to the little pink house, Mike was sitting in a rocking chair with a very small bundle in his arms. Jenna was asleep in Marty's arms where she belonged. Mama Sue was talking motorcycles with the Archangel and drinking a beer. Granny Bean was very upset that she had missed the birth of her first great-grandchild. She blamed me in full, telling me in very colorful terms what a complete mess of a person I was. She also immediately took the baby from Mike and demanded he get out of her rocking chair. And of course he obeyed. I asked Mike to join me outside the house, and I told him what happened at Stull. I handed him the cookie tin and asked him to use his best judgment in disposing of it. He took it back inside and gave it to Granny Bean. She smiled smugly. I'll get myself a new one. I like eating those butter cookies anyway, she said. It's not good for my diabetes, but I don't care. <laughs> she laughed hysterically at her own joke. Just put it in the bag over there, she said, waving towards the Hello Kitty tote bag in the corner. I know exactly where to put it when I get home, right next to that other box <laughs> that you gave me a while back, Mike. Now, Crow. If you would take this baby, I have a blanket that I need to finish. I took the newest human in my hands. It had been hundreds of years since I had held a brand new baby like this. The last one was wrapped in a rabbit skin and had beautiful black hair. This one was bald and her soul light was electric blue. <laughs>